24, 2014 committee meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission to order. My name is Jeff Griggs and I'm chairman of the commission. I'd first like to ask everybody, if you have a cell phone, please turn it on mute or vibrate. If you do get a call, I'd ask that you'd step out in the hall and take your call out there. Ms. Barber, would you call the roll, please? Here. Carol Cannon. Here. Bill Cox. Here. Here. Jeff Briggs. Here. Tony King. Here. Jeff McMillan. Here. Tom Rice. Here. Jim Ripley. James Stroud. Here. Trey T. Here. Heather Watson. Here. James Ritson. Here. We have some more. Thank you, Miss Barber. At this time, I'd like to announce and glad to have uh, Boyd Barkers here today. And he is assistant uh, commissioner with the Department of Ag, representing Judas Johnson. Appreciate you coming today, Mr. Parker. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to sign the tablet that's being passed around the room. If you would, put your name. If you're here representing a group, we ask that you would put that group beside it where we'd have a record of your attendance today. Also, uh, the only committee that is uh, scheduled on the agenda today is the Wildlife Committee. However, if you are here and you would like to address another committee today, if you would wait till the end of the wildlife, I will ask if anyone else wants to speak. And if so, raise your hand and I'll recognize you and you can come to the front. Um, for those of you that do want to address the wildlife committee, uh, make sure that you um, raise your hand and be recognized by Chairman Woodson. I would ask that you um, direct your comments or questions to the chairman. And at no time uh, do we want you to be talking or discussing anything with another member of the audience or even with the agency person that is presenting. Hold all your comments and questions to Chairman Woodson. Um, the agenda probably could be a little bit lengthy today. Uh, everybody here will have a chance to be heard. Uh, we ask that you keep your comments short and relevant, relevant to, the, uh, to the topic. Um, also, for the record, I know there's been a lot of discussion this week. The public thinks that, that we are voting and setting some seasons today. That's not the case. Uh, today is the preview day. We will be previewing hunting seasons. There will be no decisions or voting today or tomorrow uh, on hunting seasons, and I want to make that clear. Um, it is a preview only. Uh, at this time, is there any announcements, Director <laughs> Carter? Does anyone the agency have any announcements? Anyone on the commission have any announcements? If not, I will turn the meeting over to Chairman Woodson, Chair of the Wildlife Management Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. If I could ask Mr. Crabtree to join us at the microphone. I, I did, uh, as we begin the meeting, if, I had a, a question for him, and obviously Mr. Crabtree is uh, well known by members of the commission and the agency, but would really appreciate an opportunity for you to, one, of course, introduce yourself as, as you are so always kind to do, um, but also give us an update. Some time ago, you talked about Quail Forever's program and proposal to fund two biologists <coughs> that would work with private landowners and the agency. Um, and I'd love to hear a progress update on that work and also what your future plans might be. That's a lot, a lot of requirements there, Commissioner. You can I'm, handle it. I'm Ron Crabtree, and most of you know uh, when you see me, I want to talk about the most important thing that comes before this commission, and that's quail. And uh, <coughs> you're, uh, you have to be careful what you say. You people don't forget anything. Uh, in uh, February of 2013 is when I think I announced that. Uh, we had two, had money for two positions, which were the uh, wildlife biologist down in West Tennessee. And to answer that question, we've asked for why West Tennessee, that's where the money was available. And uh, even though it was approved in February, by the time those positions were advertised and the people, and they were filled, it was up into June. So uh, at June this year is when we'll need to uh, come up with some money again, and I believe that we're going to uh, have that need met with a lot more enthusiasm even than the last time. In fact, one of those wildlife biologists uh, 
went to work over in uh, Coffee County as the uh, as an employee of NRCS, and that was uh, Kevin Edge, and he is the uh, president of the Middle Tennessee Quail Forever chapter over there. So we'll have a lot of people that will have a lot more enthusiasm because they know a lot more about it. As far as our future plans, uh, my number one thing with Quail Forever is that I would like to see them uh, establish a new regional uh, or full-time regional director for Tennessee. But unfortunately, uh, just like you people, you always you don't always see the most important things. That's of course that's my opinion, but I don't give up, and I hope that will be one of the things that we'll accomplish in the future and uh, getting more word out there and speaking of those uh, two uh, biologists if you want to know what they've done the most r uh, recent quarterly report is on uh, the music city quail forever uh, website which is uh, musiccityquail.org you can see what they've been up to and uh, let you know that uh, they're uh, being accountable and doing a good job and i appreciate you uh, remembering that yes sir thank yes, you sir thank you mr crouchy any questions by members of the commission yes sir commissioner Stroud. Is it, one word? it is one word music city quail dot org right. thank you so much mr crabtree thank you appreciate all you're doing Excellent. With that, we'll go with the formal agenda. And if I could, I ask Chief Ratajak to join us. We have several items for consideration today. And uh, we'll just begin with uh, up top with the 2014-15 hunting and trapping season setting preview. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as most of you know, this is the day I most look forward to. This, this is the day that we preview all the uh, hunting season recommendations that come before you that the, the agency has agreed upon. Uh, for the coming hunting season. And what I'd like to do, I, I imagine we're going to have to dim the lights here shortly, but what I'd like to do is, is let you know that I, I will provide the introduction. There's going to be a, a number of folks that are called to the microphone over the next five, ten minutes. And um, I'll be the one that will, will provide the introduction to the, the whole season setting process. And there, there's some information I w I'd very much like to share with you. Uh, but I'll also be sharing the stage with Gray Anderson, who's our Assistant Chief of Wildlife. Uh, Chuck Yost, who's our Deer Program Coordinator, he'll be giving you the uh, information regarding, to our, regarding our Whitetail Deer Program. Roger Applegate, our Wild Turkey Program Coordinator. Uh, and then Joe Benedict will come up. There's a couple of things that we want to mention regarding migratory birds, in particular dove. And then Steve Nifong, who is our Assistant Chief of Law Enforcement, will come to the podium. Uh, I want to mention that all these folks listed that will be up here speaking is just a fraction of the people involved with this season setting process. So regarding this whole meeting today, there's too numerous personnel to mention here that are involved with this process that work equally, if not harder, than, than we do the ones presenting it. So there, there's a number of agency folks that need to be given all the credit for what we bring before you. What I'd like to do is start with just a brief overview of this whole season setting process. Most of you have heard this, but there's a few commissioners that may not have heard about how this season setting process goes down. And in particular, what do we look at as an agency when we bring forward these hunting recommendations? Now, the first thing and first and foremost thing that we are always looking at is our resource needs. We're managing game populations. We, we manage all wildlife, but when it comes to the hunting seasons, we're managing game populations. And so we're always looking at biological data, harvest data. We're gathering information on those game populations to make sure that our resource needs are met. Another thing we do during the season setting process is pay particular attention to public comments. As soon as those hunting seasons end, somewhere early January, uh, we send out a notice to the public that we are open to public comments regarding the hunting seasons. I want to let you know we gather all those, we compile all those, we put them into whatever proclamation they would affect, and all the season setting personnel are then given those pu public comments to take a look at. And lastly, wh what's really important here are human dimension surveys. Those, those public comments are usually really good for pointing out issues for us to take a deeper look at. But whenever we want to take a deeper look at whatever issue comes up, 
we rely heavily on human dimension surveys. These are scientifically conducted surveys which give us a much better information regarding what the general hunting public wishes and desires are. Now besides those three things, well, those three things obviously rely tremendously on data. And I gotta tell you a quick story. We, we very much pride ourselves uh, at TWRA to do, to use and collect a lot of data. Uh, many years ago as the deer coordinator at a meeting outside of Tennessee, one of the, the other deer biologists questioned, well, he told me a story about one of the higher ups in their agency asked about why we collect so much data because only two things would come from collecting data. One, it's gonna tell you something you don't wanna know. Two, people are gonna expect you to do something with it. And so that was the, one of the reasons they didn't wanna collect too much data. But we pride ourselves on collecting data because we believe that information is, is what allows us to make the best decisions possible and to keep our hunters and especially our resource happy. Now besides those first three things, the, another couple of things we look at Obviously our commission requests. Throughout the year, uh, every once in a while, uh, the entire commission or individual commissioners will ask us to look closely at a certain issue. We usually write those down. I've got lots of little post-it notes on my desk and we pay particular attention to those and we talk to our staff about those. And probably the biggest thing that we have going to our advantage, we have almost 700 employees and we have a lot of boots on the ground and we listen to our field personnel. When the season set in, setting process begins sometime in, in February, we're, we're talking to the people that are working the WMAs, working in the counties, trying to get their input first, and then it filters up the line until it becomes a regional recommendation, then it comes to our whole agency season setting meeting, and then it becomes an agency recommendation. So our field personnel is, is, is where a lot of this initially starts. Once we gather all that information, put it all together, uh, we will develop an agency recommendation, and that's what we're bringing before you regarding five different proclamations we'll be talking about today. Now, a couple of things I'd like to share before I, I bring up our individual coordinators is TWA has an excellent track record uh, regarding keeping our hunters happy. Uh, we conduct a, a survey, a UT survey, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in, in just a second. But one of the questions that we ask year in and year out is how satisfied are you with how TWRA manages the resources? And as you can see, we have a tremendous satisfaction rate. I believe it averages 85 or 86% satisfied for how we manage everything, all wildlife. And that's, that's something we're very, very proud of. Now, another aspect of that, if you break it down further, the last time we asked this question, 87% of our hunters were satisfied with how we managed. What I was extremely pleased with, if you look at the folks that were dissatisfied, only 1.6% were very dissatisfied. So less than 2% of our hunters think we're not doing a very good job with managing our resource. So again, we're very proud of these statistics. Now, when I talk about who our hunters are, uh, th this is something we've never done before, but I took a quick look at past surveys to find out who exactly we're talking about when we talk about the hunters. We've got a lot of them. Tennessee has a rich tradition of hunting, and, and we're blessed in that. We're, um, we're very fortunate with the number of hunters we have in Tennessee. It has held relatively steady for a long time. It, whereas most of the country was seeing steady declines, Tennessee's decline was not as sharp as, as the rest of the country. And so with the latest surveys, this is what our estimates are as far as the number of deer hunters, uh, almost a quarter of a million. Uh, 100,000 turkey hunters and about 10,000 bear hunters. Now, keep in mind, there's also another huge con contingency of hunters out there, the small game hunters. Um, over 100,000 squirrel and dove hunters, almost 100,000 rabbit hunters, and about 54,000 duck hunters. Now, keep in mind, a lot of those hunters share those same categories because they hunt all of those, but that gives you an idea and helps you put to, uh, have a better understanding of who we're trying to, to cater to here. Now, one of the things that we've done in our, in our surveys is look at our game programs, how we're managing the individual species, and we wanna ask those hunters, how happy are we managing those individual species? And the first one, the, the first line that you see here is a question asked of our turkey hunters, how, how satisfied are they with our turkey program? And it averages just over 90%. Our, our turkey hunters are extremely thrilled with how we're managing. That next line is our deer hunters. 
about 82, 83% are satisfied with how we're managing the deer program. The next, and this is the, the data that you don't want to know, um, th this is for Ron Crabtree. We, we ask our, our quail hunters how satisfied are, are they as far as TWA managing for quail, and you see uh, our satisfaction rates are not near as high as, as the other game programs. And this is, I put this in there to show you that we're not just feeding you the fluff stuff. There, there's a lot of stuff that we know that we need to address. And our quail hunters, when you ask why they're dissatisfied, it's due to the number of quail. And as everyone know, the, the habitat not being there for the quail prevents us from providing a lot of quail for the hunters. And then lastly, we ask a question. Now, this wasn't about the Dove <coughs> program in general, but how satisfied are you with the agency providing public access to Dove? And you, you could see that was a, a nice trend line going up. We've really strengthened our Dove program, and, and we're spending about $100,000 per year putting in public Dove fields. And you can see where that satisfaction rate has grown over time. So these UT surveys uh, really tell us some useful information about how the agency is managing the species and how we're keeping our hunters happy. Now, the second aspect of the season setting is, is we get these public comments in. Every January when we ask for public comments, some years we only get 30 or 40, sometimes we get two or 300. And uh, one thing I need to remind everyone is that this public comment period is, is kind of like a restaurant card mentality, a comment card mentality, where those comment cards generally sit on the table until you get a hair in the mashed potatoes, and then someone will fill out that comment card. And so it generally is not public opinion of what is going on overall, but what it helps is point out problems. If there's an issue, if someone's not wearing a hairnet, you'll, you'll find out because of that comment card. And so they're very valuable in pointing out issues in which we need to take a closer look at. And the one thing I gotta remind everyone, um, most of the commission, I believe, were sent all the public comments that we collected this past January, and there's a number of comments regarding the deer program. This obviously is because the deer program is our most popular hunting program we have. Almost a quarter of a million deer hunters. Um, it, it's extremely passionate crowd, and so when they want to comment on it, they're, they're the first ones to send in a comment. So we, we always get lots of comments regarding our deer program. And generally, the buck limit question is always the most commented on issue. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times this human dimension survey and the UT survey. What this is, the University of Tennessee, they have a special lab there, their human dimensions lab, that they've been doing surveys for our agency since 1993. And the way they conduct these surveys, so they get a, a very good feel as to what the general public feels. And when I say the general public, I'm talking about our hunters as the general public. Uh, they, they conduct their surveys using random digit dial. Uh, so they will call randomly selected phone numbers, and it used to be all landlines, but with the onset of cell phones, they, still, they nowadays call cell phone numbers. And so it's a random digit dial, and the very first question they ask is, do you hunt in Tennessee? And if they don't, that survey ends there. If they do, they continue on asking questions. And this is a criti cri critical point in getting at the true feeling of the general hunters that we have, simply because we're likely to hit landowners that might not be in our, in our database. So it, it hits across the whole cadre of folks that hunt in Tennessee. The other aspect of their survey, uh, they take our information off, off of our licensed database and they do a cross section of all license types, regardless if it's sportsman's license holders, lifetime, the, the big game gun hunters, uh, senior citizen, uh, every slew of license that we have, they take a, a sampling across each license holder. And so by, by doing the random digit dial and a survey of our license holders, we get a more accurate snapshot of the preferences of our hunters. <coughs> now, one of the things that has been talked about recently is our white-tailed deer program. And because of the public comment period in which we always get the most comments, we're constantly asking questions of our hunters to make sure that we are, that, that we are listening to the, the pulse of what the general deer hunter wants us to do. And we, we ask a question of them almost every single year about how satisfied are they with hunting, with how TWA manages deer hunting in Tennessee. 
And what you'll see here, that I previously showed you in a different format, but this is what the results were since 2001. We, we did skip a few years because we went from going, from conducting a survey every single year to doing it every other year. And you see that the satisfaction of our DEER program is, is doing excellent. You do see a drop here, and we, we sat down to figure out what was going on, and I believe we could explain this. And now keep in mind, we're still almost 80%, so th this wasn't of great concern. But this is when a lot of our hog issues came about, and so we had to back off a lot of the, the time and effort and education that we spent on the DEER program, and we invested it into the hog program. And so although you see a dip here, what I'm very pleased to see is those people showed up here with no opinion. And if you look at the dissatisfied deer hunters and you put a trend line over the last 10 years, it's still going down. That, that's a downward trend there. And so I believe that could be attributed to the fact that they're not hearing about the deer program anymore, so they just don't know, and so they ended up in the neither category. But overall, our, our deer program is very, very well accepted uh, throughout, our, throughout our hunters. Now this slide, I, I believe I showed this slide last year, and I want you to know I did not cherry pick these states. Uh, not many states do these, these deer hunter surveys. Uh, so I googled states that did a survey to see how satisfied their deer hunters were. And this is what, what the, the states that I found, what their satisfaction rates were amongst their deer hunters. And as you can see, Tennessee was above all of those. So we're, we're very, very proud of the fact that our hunters appreciate what we're doing. And I don't know why the program gets hung up right there, but I gotta escape and go to the next slide. So one of the things that has been talked about recently is the buck limits in Tennessee. And we, we usually end up talking about it almost every single year. And we're gonna do it again this year. Uh, one of the things, just to give you a brief history of buck limits in Tennessee, prior to 1998, we were divided up into many different units, and a hunter could kill up to 11 bucks in the state. In 1998, we switched to a two buck limit, and uh, it was it was a shock to many hunters. Uh, it, it was very controversial back then, and due to the controversy that ensued, dropping from 11 to two in 1999. <coughs> we went to a three buck limit, and it's been a three buck limit ever since. And one of the things that I often hear mentioned that I try to correct when I, whenever I hear it is that th they state that the deer herd improved because we made that buck limit change. And the one thing I'd like to point out is if you look at this graph here, th this is the number, the percentage of yearling bucks that are killed in Tennessee every year, and you can see it's been going down. This point here is when the downward trend began, other than this, little blip in, I believe, 1995 or 1996, the downward trend began way back here. This is where the buck limit change occurred. And so the buck, I, I will tell you, the buck limit change helped speed up that gradual progression of a healthier and healthier herd, but it wasn't so much the main cause of why our, our deer herd is so healthy nowadays. But as I said, it's always a debated topic. Again, the public comments, we got a ton of comments regarding the buck limits. And so what we do is we rely on the human dimension surveys from the University of Tennessee to give us the information we're looking for. And so what we've done over many, many years is ask our hunters about their support or opposition to the current bag limit of three antlered bucks. And this is what we, we see. We asked this on five different surveys from 2003 to 2007 and three out of four hunters supported the three buck limit. And what we did, we kinda, we, at one point we threw in another question about would they support a two buck limit? And what it developed, it developed a little conundrum for us because we had a couple of surveys that came back with, I wouldn't say they're conflicting results, but what the results were, one question said 74% of the public supported the three buck limit, but then we had for two years, we asked, would you support a two buck limit? And 63% said they would support that. And we were wondering what was going on. And then we talked to a couple of folks that do those surveys, and it was a lead in question because the question started to say, if a two buck limit would produce bigger bucks, would you support it? And they said, that was probably not a good question to ask. 
So they said a better question to begin asking is, what do you want the buck bag limit to be? And so, um, just so you know, harvest data from other states, we, we don't believe it would produce um, better results, and I, I'm going to get back to that in a second. But going back to those conflicting results, we still really want to know what our general deer hunters wanted for a buck limit. So they said the best thing is to do is give them freedom of choice. And so we reworded the question, said with a range from zero to 10, what do you think the statewide buck bag limit should be? And here are the results of those surveys. We conducted that survey four different times. And every time you see that a three buck limit was the limit of choice amongst the Tennessee deer hunters. Uh, the one thing that's very interesting to note, because again, when, we, when you look at the public comments, the majority of them, I believe is 83%, recommend lowering the buck limits. When you combine that data, again, still three is the limit of choice, but there's actually more hunters that were requesting four or more bucks than two or less. And so this is why over the years we've been very, very reluctant to change the buck bag limit because we're trying to cater to the majority of hunters. Uh, another question that we began asking a few years ago, which I think is extremely enlightening, is we asked this, regulations are often set to give hunters the maximum opportunity while still protecting the resource. For example, deer bag limits are often set as high as possible while still maintaining the health of the herd. How do you feel about this policy? The first year we asked in 2010, 84.8% .8 of the hunters agreed with that statement. We need to set the maximum bag limits we, we possibly could. We asked that again in 2012, it was up to 87%. So almost nine out of 10 hunters say, our agency should set the highest limits possible while still, having a, uh, while still protecting that resource. And so that's, that's why we've, we've been doing what we're doing is we're, we're trying to base our recommendations off these human dimension surveys. So at that point, does anyone have any questions regarding any of the human dimension surveys that we've conducted? Any questions? Chairman McMillan. Commissioner McMillan, sorry. OK. Uh, just to give you an idea of what Tennessee's data looks like, uh, th this graph is kind of a repeat of that, that other one I showed you. You can see over time, w when we were back in the, throughout the 80s and even the early 90s, we were killing a boatload of yearling bucks. It, almost 80% of our harvest was yearling bucks. So we're, it was, it was a restored population. We were more or less hunting as fast as they were being born. We were, we were shooting them. And then the changes started taking place in the early 90s and things started to improve. And we're down, uh, we average in the low 40% now for our yearling harvest rate. Uh, the flip side of that is our three and a half year old has increased um, tremendously as well. Uh, you can see again in the early 80s, we were only killing about 5%, three and a half year old. We, we did have a dip last year, but we we're over 20%. Um, three and a half year old deer were killed in Tennessee uh, the, the last couple of years pr prior, to, prior to last year. And so the number of three and a half year olds has increased, our yearlings has dropped. And this is what I wanted to remind everyone, this is without regulating the hunter. The, the three buck limit is a very liberal limit. And we see these improvements in our deer herd voluntarily. The, the hunters are doing it themselves without being restricted. And so that, that's why we've, as an agency, has been, have been very hesitant to restrict someone when they're already doing good uh, with their practices. OK, any questions? Commissioner McMillan and then Commissioner Bledsoe. Do you, are you going to show some data that would compare our uh, your age harvest to other states? Yeah, I, I could do that. I, I was, I've got it set up because we, we often get questioned about why Tennessee or, or how does Tennessee compare to other states? And I, may I proceed, Commissioner Bledsoe, or did you have another? Uh, I, okay. I was going to ask how you determine the age on these bugs. Uh, okay. Um, let me answer that before I, I show this. What Tennessee does, we, we have the luxury, we used to have a better luxury before the onset of the, the smartphone check-in, but deer and turkey, big game, had to be checked in at a check station. So all the big game animals that were harvested would be taken in whenever they're killed. We have high harvest days, opening days of turkey season, open day of deer season, um, whether or not it's muzzleloader or gun, 
there's a ton of deer that are brought to check stations. Luckily, there's still a lot of deer going to check stations. And what that is is a random sample of the deer that are being brought in. So it's a really, really good cross-section to show us what the age classes of the deer that are being brought in. Now, age data, yeah, I was going to say age data, we don't take any data that the public sends in as far as how old their deer was. On the opening day of gun season, open day of muzzleloader season, we man almost every biologist and a lot of our officers are working those check stations on those opening days to see as many deer as possible. And it's only agency biologists that will age a deer and give us the information that we put into our database. And so it's, it's trained wildlife biologists that are making those determinations. And keep in mind, when we collect that data, we're looking anywhere from 3,000. In our heyday, we were looking at six or 7,000 deer, but our age estimates are based on three or 4,000 bucks every year that we're looking at, that our biologists individually are looking at. Great, we, and we do have several commissioners who've got questions, and so I wanna be a little sensitive to where we are in your presentation. Are you getting close to the end of this part, or would yes. you like to have more questions? Um, I, 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 could, I can entertain Commissioner McMillan's uh, question about other states in okay. the next two minutes. Okay, cool. So a couple of things just okay. for the, our audience, um, for their purposes. I know we've got either a, a comment or a question or so from the audience. So if you'll, we'll get to the end of the presentation yes. and then hear from the public. And if I could, members, we'll get to the end. We'll make sure yes. we don't get I, past I'll, I'll, I'll stop soon as we get to this. Um, get through uh, answering Commissioner McMillan's question, and then we have Commissioner Stroud and Commissioner Teague who have questions. Unless there, it's time sensitive, I'm happy to recognize well, you. Well, if, if it's okay with you, Jeff, I'd like to comment on what he, the question, and I'll be done. Absolutely. I was checked twice uh, uh, this year, this past year. Uh, by uh, in two different places for for the deer and they aged the deer and it was really really intricate they took their time they're very smart and it was it was done really well so your biologist I experienced uh, was was excellent I, 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 I need to apologize when I'm up here talking about all the great work we do because it's the folks that work for our agency that, that do all the good all the good work Okay, th this is actually related to the okay. slide previous to this slide, Commissioner Teague. Just me looking at that, it looks like about the time there was a reduction in bucks, there's been a significant decrease since that time, and you said it did. It, 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 it sped, led up. To, it sped, it sped that up. up. The, the, the improvement of the overall herd health, it, it absolutely did get us to where we are faster. We would still be getting to that point if we still had a crazy limit, but it'd be at a much slower pace. So I would not, I would not argue that the, um, that the buck reduction did not help. It, it sped things up quite a bit, but it wasn't the cause of the, the reduction. And in the last five years, we're actually on a different trend, it looks like. Well, 2009 the, the, to 2013, there's an increase in, there's a decrease in three and a half yeah, year old I, I or think, older bucks. I think bucks. The, the, the telling year this coming year, uh, you're looking right here. Um, the, the next point will, will be telling because the, those last three years, the, those were about the same. And then there was a drop last year, which we, we, we try not to make big reactions. If, if there's, there's a big change in a data point, we usually like to have at least two data points to make sure it's not going drastically in one direction. And so th this coming year would a absolutely be a, a big thing to look at. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from commission? Okay, Chief. Okay. Uh, Commissioner McMillan asked about how Tennessee compares to some of the other states. And, and one of the things that we, we've tried to do for a number of years is educate our deer hunters as far as why we're managing and how we're managing and to Set them up with realistic expectations, uh, and, and that's quite difficult because there, there's a lot of television shows, magazines that are, are sporting some really grossly large and wonderful deer that everyone would love to kill, but we have to tamper it down to, to make sure that the hunter realizes that that's probably not likely going to happen um, to each and every hunter out there. And so what, we, what we've done for a number of years is is look at our buck limits and, and what they're providing. And one of the questions that is always raised, and again in the public comments, is about a two buck limit. And 
people often look at, uh, there's a publication, the Quality Deer Management Association puts out their, their whitetail deer report. And what they do is they publish the data from all the other states as far as their yearling harvest rates and many other pieces of information. And we're often asked, uh, Chuck Yost, our deer biologist, is, is often asked about how do we compare to other states? And so we've, we've addressed that uh, many, many times. This is the table that shows all the states and it's broken out by the, the Midwest, the, the, the Northeast and the Southeast. And all the state's information is in there. And this is one and a half year old harvest, three and a half year old harvest. And what I wanna do is just show you how we compare to our sister states. And so Tennessee's, we're just gonna look at the percentage of yearling harvest. And this is why we're always questioned, what, what are we doing wrong? If you look at the, the yearling harvest rate in Tennessee, we're right about 42%. This is over the course of 2010 to 2012. And we're at 41%, 42%, 43%. But it's pretty flat. We're in the low 40s. So let's see what the other state's yearling percentage of yearling har harvest rate is. If you look at Arkansas, they're only killing about 10% yearlings. Then the state of Mississippi is killing about 13% yearlings. In Texas, they're right around 20%. And in many portions of Missouri, they're about 20, 24%. And so right away, you say, man, Tennessee is doing something wrong because these other states are, are killing so many less, such a lower percentage of yearlings. Well, what's not mentioned in that table when people are looking at it is that if you kill a yearling buck in those states, you're likely to get a ticket because they operate under antler restrictions. And so it's illegal to kill a yearling buck. And the reason there, there's even yearlings in this, this harvest for example, Mississippi has a, um, it's a 10 inch spread or a 13 inch main beam in order to shoot a buck in many parts of Mississippi. And so if you don't shoot that, if you shoot something less, you could get a citation. Uh, the yearlings that show up in the harvest are the yearlings that exceed that limit. And what they found on many of their WMAs with those antler restrictions is they're killing their best yearlings and they're actually causing a high grading effect where their overall antlers are actually going down because of those regulations. Now keep in mind, it was definitely a recommendation by the biologist for an antler restriction because Mississippi never had a check-in system. So their bag limits were literally unenforceable because no one ever had to check in their deer. And so the only way to control the number of bucks getting killed was to put an antler restriction on it. So it was something that they wanted and it has helped reduce their, their buck harvest, but that's why their yearling harvest rate looks like the way it does in, in all those states. Now what about southeastern states that don't have any antler restrictions? What do those look like? Again, there's the Tennessee data and surely we got to be better than Alabama or Louisiana. Well if you look at Alabama, they're, they're killing about 25 percent yearlings and Louisiana is only killing about 16 percent yearlings. What's going on there? Well in the table, they have a double asterisk in there that says the data from that, those states come from check stations or DMAP areas. Well, Alabama and Louisiana don't operate check stations like Tennessee does. So most of their data is coming from DMAP areas, which are primarily quality deer management clubs. And so if Tennessee, we, we do have some DMAP areas. We also have some WMAs that are operated with those restrictions. If Tennessee just used our DMAP data and it was published, that's what the Tennessee data would look like. So we would be, we'd be looking pretty good in that, in that table if we used the same data that some of the other states are, are using. Now I don't want to offend any of the other states, that's the only data they have. They don't have the option to collect the data like we do, but that's why their data looks so good. And so the last thing I wanna do is just show you again in that table that gets published, um, the states surrounding us and even some of the best deer hunting states in the country that don't use antler restrictions, that literally limit their hunters by a one buck limit or a two buck limit. I think one or two of these may even have a three buck limit, but most of them have a one or two buck limit. Uh, we'll start with Kentucky. Everyone loves Kentucky. Deer hunting in Kentucky is fantastic. There's their harvest rate. I believe it's about thir yearling harvest rate. I believe it's about 34%. There's Illinois, which I believe is a two buck limit in most areas. It's, it's convoluted in, in some of the sections. Uh, there's Indiana, which I know is a two buck limit. There's Ohio, which a lot of people go to Ohio to deer hunt. And then the number one Boone and Crockett state uh, for the longest time was Wisconsin, and that's their yearling harvest rate. 
where does Tennessee fit in all of these? We're smack dab in the middle. And so keep in mind, many of those states that are on that graph there already operate under a one or two buck limit. So if we expect to move that line in Tennessee, I don't believe a two buck limit would, would move that line. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is one of the last things I'll say, last year we just looked at the data. We had 2,423 hunters that killed three bucks in Tennessee. If you recall, we had 240,000 deer hunters. And so that's 1% of all deer hunters killed their, their maximum of, of three bucks. And so if we want to move that line, the best way to move that line obviously would be antler restrictions, which are very unpopular according to our, our surveys. Um, or if we use that DMAP data, but we, we have much better data to use. And so um, we, we just want to make sure that we're always telling our hunters what the realistic expectation should be regarding our regulations. Now, the one thing that we could do, um, we, we've been doing this, this UT survey for a number of years. If, if there's another survey you'd like us to do, we, we, again, would love to do a scientific survey so we get the general wishes of, of the deer hunters. But it could be asked about bag limits, season dates, anything that we want. If, if that's the will of the commission, we could, we could go that route. But other than that, that's all I was going to talk to you about before I, I call up uh, Chuck Yost to begin the, the deer presentation. Okay, um, questions from Commission Commissioner Cox. Daryl, do you happen to know what the uh, total buck harvest was in 1998? I could find it in about. Or compare if the buck harvest from 97 to 99 in that year went down yeah. or stayed the same? I, I could get that. Harvest. I don't know it off the top of my head. I could get it really quickly. When we go on break, I can come back with, with all that information. Commissioner McMillan? Obviously, the QDMA is interested in a better quality deer, more of a trophy deer, and you showed us a yearly limit, uh, I mean yearly uh, statistics compared to other states, but what about like a three and a half or four and a half old deer? How many of our deer that are being aged compared to the wise percentage they're taking are, are up in, in, in the later age? They, they only go three, they go one and a half, two and a half, and then three and a half plus. All, all those other deer are lumped. Um, I, we, we could pull all that stuff up to see how we compare. Well, I think that would be important as far as we can determine if our three and a half year old deer compared to Ohio or Kentucky, what well, the antlers look like. Oh, well, well that you mentioned that. Uh, Dan Gibbs, uh, our Region 4 uh, big game biologist, about seven or eight years ago, uh, did a study between was it Ohio deer, um, Tennessee deer, and Ohio? And the reason we used Ohio was simply because Ohio had similar information that they collected from one and a half all the way up to five and a half. And we looked at the, the size of antlers between deer in Tennessee and the deer in Ohio. And there was a one year age shift. And so, where a two, a, a two and a half year old deer in the northern states looks like a three and a half year old deer in Tennessee. So a lot of times when, when folks go up to those other states and they see a big deer up there, it may not be as old as they think. They, it may not be that four and a half, five and a half year old. There's actually a one year age shift in the size of antlers to those Midwestern, the, those corn belt states, so to speak. And so uh, oftentimes, a, another prime example is just within the state of Tennessee, there's tremendous variation. You could easily look at our data. A deer that's killed in Montgomery County, which is one of our best producing counties, it's right on the Kentucky border. Uh, the, the typical uh, two and a half year old deer in Montgomery County is an eight point, where the typical four and a half year old deer, I believe in Granger County or some of those East Tennessee counties, four and a half year old deer is still seven points. And so if people are seeing smaller age or smaller rack deer in some parts of our state, especially the, the forested mountainous areas, they might not be young deer. They're older deer that are getting killed, but they just don't produce the rack that they do when they're, they're feeding on agricultural fields every single day. And so you, you see it in West Tennessee. Our biggest, our biggest deer come from the agricultural parts of our state. And along with the follow-up from Commissioner Cox, would you mind to just pull the data for the older, the, yes. the larger, great, it would be great. I got one more. Commissioner uh, Cox? The, the inference is from some of the comments that, that, that if a buck gets older, he's automatically going to be a big deer. And you touched on it just now. What are the factors 
that, uh, that you really need to, it, to grow? The three factors. Uh, age is obviously one of them, genetics and nutrition. Uh, genetics, individual deer have genetics. A population of deer doesn't really have genetics. A, a deer could be born and just never have the ability to create a large set of antlers. It just doesn't have the, the genetics to grow something big. It, it's, it's like height in humans. Um, some deer are just have what it takes to grow big antlers. But even those deer that have the genetics to grow big antlers, if they're provided the age, it's, they still might not grow the big antlers unless they're provided the nutrition. It's a combination of all three. You have to have really good nutrition, you have to have really good genetics, and you have to have the age on them in order to grow the massive antlers that most people are looking for. And the unfortunate case in Tennessee, we're, we're often, one of the things that kills us is when the glaciers receded, they stopped at the Tennessee-Kentucky border. And when those glaciers receded, they deposit, deposited all those very fertile soils. Anyone that's been in the Midwest where it's called the breadbasket for a reason, we grow most of our agricultural crops out there. A deer throughout its whole life living in those, those highly agricultural areas eat highly nutritious foods all the time. In Tennessee, I believe the percentage of forest and cover in Tennessee is 60 or 70 percent, I, I forget what it is, but it, the majority of Tennessee is forested. There's not much food in a forested area for deer. They're, they're just nibbling on browse and, and anything they can get their hands on. So our deer, unfortunately, are not afforded the maximum nutrition that many of these other states can provide. And if you look at the numbers, we, we did this comparison six, seven years ago in our hunting guide, the number, the raw number of older age class deer killed in Kentucky versus killed in Tennessee, we actually killed more three and a half year old deer in Tennessee that year, but Kentucky put in 10 times more Boone and Crockett bucks than we did. And it was simply because of, of that factor. We, we can't produce the volume of the large antler deer because of that nutrition base. Okay. Commissioner Bledsoe, then Commissioner McMillan. Um, as far as overall deer harvest, uh, say compared to 98 when we went down to the two buck limit, had did the overall number of deer being harvested change? I mean, I mean we're at a million something deer right now estimated, and you know the 650,000. Oh, six, well, there you go. You better than we, we did it. We did it. But uh, I mean that. We're at a, a pretty good carrying capacity. There's there's deer everywhere. Yes. Right? Um, what, what which one's going to have the most impact on the overall population, if any? I mean, if we're killing more does, I know it's going to reduce the population. I was going to say, to be honest with you, the the best way and the only way we really need to manage our deer herd is through doe harvest. And, and so, if if we could get closer to a 50 50 percent where we're killing just as many does as bucks, that would ensure. A, a very good buck to doe ratio and if we could just dial in on the number of deer I, I believe we're where we're at when it comes to deer you can see the exponential growth that we had during the restoration phase and although some states are talking about this deer decline I was just showing this to Alan Peterson earlier today Tennessee is not seeing it we're not seeing it in our deer we're not seeing it in our turkeys we're harvesting pretty much a flat line and it, it's I, I don't want to say it concerns us but what most people see is a peak and then a drop off and then a leveling out. Our deer and turkey overall numbers are still pretty much flatlined. And I think what that is, we absolutely do have areas where the, the deer and turkey populations are going down, but we still have areas in other parts of the state where it's going up, so that balances it out. But I, I think from a carrying capacity, we have the deer we're gonna have. We're, we're not gonna see major increases, and I doubt we'll see major decreases. Part of the reason is the deer in Tennessee outnumber the hunters three to one. We have 240,000 deer hunters and about, say, 750 deer. So there's three deer to every hunter. The first thing to understand is only half of our hunters are successful. So we're talking about 100,000 deer hunters. They would have to be killing four or five deer per person in order to really do decimation to our deer herd. And they don't do that. There's limiting factors one of which is freezer space. If someone kills one or two deer, they're done for the season. They don't want to put up more. Yes, you do have those um, monster hunters that will kill 20, 30 deer, give the, that deer away, but for the most part, 
the average deer hunter, I think our highest on record was 1.4 deer per successful hunter. Commissioner McMillan. Okay, let, let me try to understand this, Daryl, because you said there was three factors. You said age, genetics, and nutrition. Yes. We obviously can't affect the genetics. Uh, nutrition maybe a little, so really I'll, go ahead. No, I was going to say the, the nutrition thing, and this is, this is where quality deer management is fantastic. Right. The, the individuals that want to manage for that can do stuff to provide more nutrition with food plots and other things. And so on an individual hunter basis, if that's what they're managing for, they're, they, they see tremendous success by doing that. But the other factor is age. And so I, I guess it's, I want to understand that if, if the agencies, I guess their opinion is that if we try to go to a two buck limit, we're really not going to increase the level of trophy animals that the QDMA won't, so it's really not worth doing. Is that my understanding? Well, I've, I think all the agency is saying, uh, now understand from a resource standpoint, it would not affect, if we went from a three buck to a two buck limit, literally all we would do is kill less bucks. Um, we, we probably wouldn't see a significant increase in the number of, of older age class deer that show up. Um, and so, all the information we have says the current limit is not is not negatively impacting our deer herd, and so we we don't have justification to recommend it. And so that's why we're not recommending it. If it was a hunter choice, we would re recommend it there. But again, the human dimension surveys say that the the hunters in general are happy with the three buck. And so. The only reason we're not recommending it is because we don't see a need biologically and we don't see a need from a human dimension standpoint. I think most hunters, as they go through the phases of their life and their hunting, as they get older, like obviously I am, if I want meat, I'm going to shoot a doe now. If I, I'm going to let every buck pass unless I want to put it on the wall. And so I think there's a lot of people that self-impose their own restrictions, and that may be why we, get, we are getting some bucks that are living longer and, and, and getting better racks. But there again, I guess my question still is going from three to two, in your opinion, is not going to increase the trophy size. We're just going to kill less deer. Actually, Mississippi, um, Mississippi had a paper, I have it on my jump drive, that, that shows when they did their antler restrictions, they killed fewer deer, and there was an insignificant increase in the number. Now, don't get me wrong. There will be more older bucks in the herd. But just because they're in the herd doesn't mean they end up in the back of the pickup truck. Because of poor genetics and nutrition. That, and they're harder to kill, too. <laughs> Commissioner Cannon. Darrell, would you go back to your recommendation <clears throat> slide, please? Oh, the, yes. What is the cost for a scientific survey to be done? I, I actually had Roger Applegate, who's our human dimension uh, professional in our agency, contact um, responsive management, and it, it would be more than what, what I initially thought. Uh, the, the last couple that we did ran around $30,000. Okay. Uh, let's just say if it's $30,000, and I was doing some math on if it was 10, but if my head math is roughly right, we're talking about 12 cents mm -hmm. per hunter across the state. Um, I'm, I'm opinion only, and I'm not speaking to the proclamations that we're considering today, but this subject is coming up enough to where, and it, it is such a significant part of our outdoor industry that we have the pleasure to, to oversee. There's enough people I respect, probably the most of is Trey D, uh, who has been wondering about this, as have other hunters that I have an utmost respect, that at some point, and I don't know when it's the appropriate time, and I'm sure not proposing it right now, but uh, your recommendation uh, I would support. And uh, I think it would be timely. I think the question has been what questions are being asked. And we're getting things like there's an overwhelming tide the folks who want a reduction in buck limits. And I'm not putting you on the spot, but even a minute ago, you said we got a ton of comments. Well, we got 112 comments <laughs> related to deer. And if you boil it, start boiling it down, we, of those 112, we have 55 that basically say they want to see a reduction in buck limits. Um, 
I don't think that's the right tool to be measuring whether we reduce or, or don't reduce. Uh, but I think we need to have an intentional tool out there whose purpose is to evaluate what's going. I ask the questions better, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And so a long way around the barn, and please forgive me for this long-winded speech, uh, I concur. And I believe that the question, the people who are asking the questions, um, it's fair, and it's fair to our hunting public, and in particular, uh, I know Commissioner Teague is very interested in this. Other hunters are interested in this. I hope we're able to do this. And Commissioner Cox. What is the difference between the what UT does and a scientific survey? There is no difference. We, we've been doing um, the UT surveys, which is a scientific survey for 1993. We have all that information. The only thought of having someone else do it is to see if their results compare to what UT has come up with. But we're already contracted with UT to do surveys, so yes. maybe changing the questions might be better than spending an extra $30,000, perhaps. What, what, whatever you advise for us to, to well, do. And, we, and we I, actually, I might start having an opinion about how we can, I mean, if we're going to go through the trouble of really being exact, the questions are important, but I think in terms of polling and getting accuracy, $30,000 is, is a significant amount of money, but I think given the debate and conversation in comparison to the budget, I think it might be worth the investment to be as exact as possible if there's interest by members of the commission to make a reasoned, answer, a reasoned decision on this over the course of whatever period of time. So I, I, I agree with the, the frugalness and making sure we're very diligent about the questions, but in terms of cost, that, that's not out of line, and, and one might argue it could be a lot more expensive than that. So I think whatever pricing you've done is quite efficient. Commissioner Cannon. Forgive me for jumping back in. Commissioner Cox has a way of asking the question I'm thinking, so thank you. Um, I, I do agree with that. I mean, the university is working for us, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, we're their client, and therefore we have the opportunity to guide those questions. And if we can accomplish the same means using the university and it be less dollars, and you write out a detailed scope to where you and the agency staff are satisfied that this is this is how it needs to be conducted. I hope we'll explore that if we choose to do that. Yeah. So. And, and again, I would agree too. The University of Tennessee has done significant research in this area, and I'm, I'm sure are very capable of, of accomplishing whatever it is we would request. Um, uh, that sounds great. Any other questions from Commission? Because I, yes, sir, Commissioner Stroud. If you don't mind, do you have any statistics or do you have any concerns about disease? compared to other states around us? Have we been affected more no, or less or anything? Well, like well, there's two primary deer diseases that are of concern. Chronic wasting disease, which Tennessee has never detected. The, the closest we have, we, we do have a couple of bordering states, Missouri, West Virginia, or Virginia, West Virginia. Um, West Virginia doesn't border. But it hasn't crossed the Tennessee boundary. And we're, we're very thankful for that. We monitor. We, we don't do a ton of monitoring. Uh, but the reason being, CWD appears to be a disease that moves by truck because a lot of the places that discover CWD are, are captive facilities, and we don't allow uh, private ownership of deer. So we're blessed in that we don't have a lot of deer farms or anything like that. And so we've, we've monitored, I believe, 7,000, almost 8,000 deer over the last decade or so, and we tested them for CWD, and all have come back uh, not found. Um, and we'll continue that monitoring. The other disease, which I should make note, uh, we, I don't know if it'll hit this year, is EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease. And it's transmitted by a, a virus in, the, in a midge, a coelicoides, that's the species of biting midge. And they bite the deer, the deer ends up dying within a matter of weeks, uh, usually in the summertime. And those midges are usually found around water sources and it appears that every once in a while, it's cyclical. Um, every year we have deer die from EHD. In fact, last year we had four or five counties report um, EHD mortality. Uh, 2007, we got cremated by EHD because we had a drought year, the water sources were concentrated, that concentrated the deer there. And the thing is, the deer that get bit by EHD, a lot of them die, but a certain percentage of them 
of them live because they, they have immunity to it. And so those deer that live pass on their genes, and so there's a resistance for about four or five years. But we haven't had a big outbreak of EHD since 2007. So I just want to let everyone know that it's on the horizon. I don't know if it'll hit this year, next year, or in five years. But we, we lost a ton of deer in 2007, and you can see a dip um, in that harvest graph that could easily be explained. Um, it, it's something that's natural. There's no concern between the hunters or anything. It just wipes out deer populations pretty quickly. And when I say wipe them out, I'm not completely gone. Uh, individual properties might get affected real heavily, but uh, if we, we might have a 20, 30 percent reduction in the deer herd in a in a large area due to EHD. It, it, for the most part, the, the, the last couple of years when we had it, it affected a, a small portion of the county. But in 2007, it affected the majority of the state. Like Two-thirds of the state lost a lot of deer. Can I ask a question quickly? What's a midge? It's a little biting insect. Those Thank things, you. the no seams that you're always Thank you. swatting. And unless there is objection by members of the commission, um, we're going to keep moving forward with this conversation instead of taking a break. Is everybody all right? Excellent. Commissioner Teague. I've got several things, but anyway, just, I guess bear with me for a minute. Um, I think you told me at one point the year we had a two buck limit was the only year we ever harvested more does mm -hmm. um, than bucks. Um, we're not happy with our population, right? We would like it to decrease to some degree. Depends on who you ask. Um, we have a three doe per day. Yes. It, and that's unit, obviously yes, it, that, geared that's towards good, reduction. Yes. Right? In unit L, we appear to have ample deer. And, and we set ridiculous limits. We, we know people aren't going to kill three does per day. But it sends the message it's OK to shoot does. And believe it or not, although you could kill three bucks and 330 does, most of those counties still kill more bucks than does. And if we could turn that, I, I would, that, that would be a benefit to us. One of the things I think we've failed to mention today is that by limiting the buck harvest, and, and you can answer this in your opinion, that I'm just giving my opinion at this point, um, I don't know that we will have a drastic change in the amount of year and a half old yearling deer, but if we were at two, would that not provide opportunity for more hunters to kill these deer than just fewer hunters killing these deer? Yeah, and it's it's something that you have to weigh the the cost and benefit. For, for giving up a buck, yes, it will increase the opportunity, but w what we don't see is those bucks in the back, we don't see them in the back of the pickup trucks. Th that does not mean they're out living. Uh, Alan Peterson and I talk about this all the time. When we went from 11 bucks down to two, we saved how many? 20,000 20, bucks from getting killed with that reduction. And we expected to see an increase of a lot of deer um, a few years down the road because we saved all those bucks. And those bucks never showed up. I believe and like 2,000 of them or 3,000 showed up. So even though you saved 20,000, they don't end up in the harvest. And so it, it's just it's just a cost benefit analysis that you have to do to restrict uh, the hunters. We we will save bucks. There will be more available to them, but we don't usually see it in the harvest. And even the Mississippi data said the exact same thing. They they're on the hoof, but they're not in the truck. Okay. So if we limit the hunters to two bucks, and ten guys are hunting one farm, you don't think that they're going to kill the same amount of deer, but it'll be spread throughout the hunters. I feel like it would provide more opportunity, especially with limited public areas, for hunters, regardless of what kind of buck they wanted to shoot, the chance at filling their tag. You said what percentage of our deer hunters were successful? Uh, usually about 50%. And that's shockingly low to me. Um, that's not per day, right? That's the whole no. year? Yeah, that's, that's the whole year. Right, buck or doe, right, nothing. They don't Yes, and, and I believe most of that, if you look at license types, the, the folks that buy the, the big game gun, which there's, I think, 60, last year, 62,000 hunters were out deer hunting with just the, that gun permit. And so 
there's a lot of guys out there that buy it and may only hunt one or two days and then be done with it. And so the, they factor into that equation and, as to why we only have 50% success rate. Well, you mentioned Quality Deer Management Association several times and used some of their statistics and their information. They, uh, am I wrong in saying that they were in favor of a two buck limit for our state? The, they didn't, I, I don't believe they provided a recommendation. Um, they, they put out a blast about um, having the hunters come, right. but I don't, I don't know if they would officially go on record as to say what they, I, I can't speak for them. I'm, it may have just been emails I received from their regional, I don't know what they call them, directors or. Um, as far as the survey goes, um, the phone survey, um, it's my personal opinion. I, I don't feel it could be accurate. I've, I've never received one, probably because I don't answer my phone if I don't know who it is <laughs> and I don't have a home phone. And I think that would be the case for most yeah. people that I talk to on a daily basis. So we may want to look so at much. some. Screening our calls. Yeah, well, I don't screen your calls. Well, I'll, I'll return the call, though, you know, if they leave a message, but... Um, if you see UT calling, I think you'd want to answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, back, back to work. I don't know, Commissioner T. I, I don't know where you're going with that. Um, <laughs> uh, only 1% of our hunters harvest three bucks anyway. I think a lot of that could be attributed to most people shoot whatever's allowed and save one tag for a trophy. If I can interject, that, that's a great point, and I'm not saying if, if we reduce the buck limit, that's the only number of bucks we would receive, or we would kill, or we would save. If we went down, there's a number of people that kill two bucks that wouldn't kill two bucks because they'd be afraid of limiting out. So th that, that is a very valid point, is that it'd save more than that. And only 1% of our hunters, um, we really wouldn't be, if, if there's a chance it could help and it's only affecting 1%, you know, it seems... Uh, and, and I'm voicing my opinion, which is, I usually don't in here, I try to voice the opinion of people I represent and constitu constituents, but overwhelmingly the people that I talk to and receive stuff from are in favor of a two buck, so. But I would be in favor of some type of poll to get the opinion, but a phone survey I'm not sure is gonna give us the results we need. I think, you know, I don't know if we can have a question for the first buck or first deer that's harvested and just simply ask, would you be in favor of a two buck um, limit in Tennessee? Because all those agree, disagree, barely disagree, I mean, that's, I think it's just a, a pie graph that doesn't tell us a lot. We will take the advice of the commission on how they want to proceed. If, if we are to stay with the University of Tennessee doing the survey, I believe their human dimension lab uses the phone survey. So. Commissioner Cox, or Commissioner Teague, any further questions? Okay, Commissioner Cox, then Commissioner Bledsoe. I was not going to, to go into this, but, and I certainly don't want to sound patronizing to Trey because he's so young, but um, when I leased some land, or our, our club leased some land when my boys were very young. For 10 years, we killed 25 bucks off that 1,000 acres, and we shot everything, had a hard ear everything and didn't kill a lot of big deer kills one or two but we had more fun than we have ever had and we bought another place and moved to it and inst instituted a big buck program and the first year we did it about the third hunt my boys wouldn't get out of the bed to go hunt so i asked them what the problem was and they told me they didn't feel like they would see a deer that was big enough for them to shoot or if they shot one smaller that they would kind of be ridiculed so there's a whole nother dynamic to what we're talking about if we ruin it for the kids that are not big buck hunters uh we're taking a chance on our future and i and that's kind of where i am with this i understand that the two and the one and the three and the, and all the the, the 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 age and the killing the does and all that but i'm uh, my children taught me a lesson, and I'm in a good spot right now, so I'm not, I can't support that. Hold on Reduce. one moment, Commissioner Bledsoe. Commissioner Teague? Yeah, um, uh, I appreciate your opinion, and I, I share that to some degree. I think sometimes the sport gets lost in only wanting a big buck or something to go on the wall or a number, a Boone and Crockett or a score. But, um, you know, I, I'm not in 
I'm not saying we need to go to a width restriction or an antler length, beam length, number of point restriction. Um, what I brought up only limited the people to two bucks, um, and it didn't have any restrictions on what they are. They can shoot whatever two bucks uh, makes them happy or makes them get out of bed. So I think there's a way that we can still fulfill the needs of people who in no way, shape, or form are interested in any kind of quality deer or shooting a big buck. I think you'll be hard pressed to find someone that said they wouldn't rather shoot a big buck. But I understand people, you know, they don't want to, they want to, and, and the other point I did not make, I, I would, if this was to be brought up or voted on, I would like to say we should, in my opinion, um, you know, leave the juvenile deer hunters out of this where they can, uh, you know, still harvest uh, what they can at this point. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm sensitive that everybody doesn't think like I do and like a lot of people do, but I think that obviously they still have opportunity to uh, shoot whatever two bucks they want in this scenario and an endless amount of does, which I hope they take advantage of. Commissioner Bledsoe. 